Hello, everyone, and welcome to Discovering a User-Facing Concept. I'm uh, Christopher DeBella, and uh, this, this talk sort of came about uh, because I've been interested in using concepts since around 2016, when I first uh, had them brought to my radar, and uh, I felt like I had a pretty good understanding of them up until around the middle of 2018, when Eric Niebler, uh, who, uh, who helped uh, me understand a, a fair bit of this alongside Casey Carter, uh, tweeted out one day that uh, although uh, concepts are constraints on types, you don't find them by looking at the types in your system, but rather by studying the algorithms. And this uh, this shook up how I um, how I thought about concepts entirely because I went back and looked at all the stuff that was being standardized and realized that is definitely the approach that was being taken. And that while I did have some of the things correct, there are a lot of things that, uh, that definitely were, uh, were missing in my understanding. And from that, I was able to build a new basis, but it has also led to a bit of confusion. And so I think now that since we're in 2022, it's probably a good idea that we have uh, a look at not only how does, does the language feature work, which is uh, what a lot of people have spent time focusing on, but rather how do we actually effectively use this language feature? And so that means that uh, in order to fully appreciate this talk, you will need to already have a solid understanding of how the concepts language feature works because we will not be going into any detail about that whatsoever. Uh, if you're unfamiliar with how uh, the language feature works, then please watch Andrew Sutton's uh, concepts in 60, everything you need to know about concepts and nothing you don't. It is, in my opinion, the best concepts talk that I've, that I've seen. And the reason for this is because Andrew goes through all the things that are relevant to day-to-day -day programming with concepts rather than looking at the esoteric language feature. As I, the esoteric features of, uh, of the, this particular aspect of C++. And he really dives into how can we actually use this effectively? Uh, but that's uh, that's more of a, a, a light uh, a light tangent uh, when he's talking about what is this language feature. Um, uh, uh, I sort of take this to the next level where we look at how can we use this to then follow uh, follow on and maximize uh, using concepts. Um, one of the reasons, another one of the reasons why Andrew is a uh, a great starting point is because he actually understands the language feature at its at its core, uh, because he is one of the people that uh, that championed it uh, all throughout uh, the standard. He's uh, the project editor for the Concepts TS back in 2015, and then really drove it for C++20. He's implemented it twice in GCC, so he really does know what he's talking about in this uh, in this regard. This talk is about concepts which find the their basis in generic programming. So you should probably have a bit of an understanding about what generic programming is before you come into uh, this session. If you are unfamiliar with generic programming there, uh, or need a, a little bit of a refresher, um, there is a, a, a brief component in this talk where we'll, we'll look at what generic programming is. But to fully appreciate generic programming, I strongly recommend watching Sean Parent's generic programming talk uh, from a few years ago. Uh, because it really goes through the history of generic programming and gives you an appreciation for what it is. Far better than I can ever uh, give in five or ten minutes. Now, there are more than a few people who helped me uh, get through the, uh, the design of this talk. Some people reviewed it. Some people answered a question. Some people uh, helped uh, pivot me in a particular direction. And so I just like to, to thank them. And then finally, before we, uh, we move on to the... The main, uh, the main part of the talk. Um, there are there are three uh, acts to this uh, to this presentation. The um, each act is going to uh, build on the previous act, and there is an optional epilogue if time allows for it. Uh, I will be taking questions definitely at the end of Act One and Act Two. If there is time for the epilogue, I will probably not take questions in act, at the end of Act 3 and defer those to uh, the end of the epilogue, just that way the epilogue has a natural flow to it. So let's, uh, let's get started with uh, Act 1. And 
the start of Act 1, we are going to go back to Eric's tweet and have a think about what uh, all this means. So when I have, uh, have talked about looking at concepts in uh, and thinking about what, what kinds of concepts you want to be writing in uh, a post this tweet world, I, uh, when talking to people, I have uh, often heard people say, well, I don't really use uh, things like std find or std count. Uh, and and uh, things like, well, what if I want to have an, a number concept? Like that's, that, that's corresponding to types. Can, can, can I do that? And so I think we need to address these two particular questions first. And the more important one, I think, is to address the, uh, the question of, well, I don't use std find or anything else in the algorithm header. Can I use concepts still? And um, so let's, let's first distill what an algorithm is. And I pulled up two definitions from two different prominent uni textbooks. Um, and they both say in their own words that an algorithm is a, is a description of a computation where it takes input and yields output in some finite number of steps to solve a problem. That's it. It's just a, a problem solving mechanism that, uh, that we computer scientists use and occasionally mathematicians use. An algorithm isn't restricted to the contents of the algorithm and numeric headers. Uh, those are the generic algorithms of the C++ standard library, but any function is pretty much an algorithm. It doesn't matter whether it's a GCD or it's, a, uh, or it's an A star uh, search on a graph or if it's a regular expression search. Um, these, these are all different kinds of algorithms. And so if you're writing a function and you want to parameterize that function, that is turn it into a template, then yes, you should absolutely still be thinking about concepts. Um, the literature for generic programming actually starts out with GCD uh, quite often. And uh, it takes a lot of time before we move into something that is range-based. And the range-based stuff is what we find in these two generic algorithm headers. This talk will be looking at generic algorithms, so things like the generic algorithms, because that is my background and that is where the majority of the research has been done. It's much easier to communicate um, uh, those things. This leads us to the second question, which is, so what does this mean for, uh, for types? Uh, can, we, can we write a container concept or a number concept? And while I'll explain on this again at the very end, the answer is pretty much no, please don't do this. The reason for that is because concepts don't map to Java or C-sharp interfaces. Uh, they are looking at saying, what does an algorithm or a type need in order to do something as opposed to um, saying, what do I need to implement to say this thing is going to meet some sort of, some sort of defined interface? And that, that may sound uh, like it's the same thing, but an interface in, uh, in Java will, uh, will say, you need to have all of these functions implemented before you can instantiate a particular instance of this type. Whereas with a concept, it's saying, do you have this thing? And if we were to implement something like a container concept, then we would be having to add, and it was corresponding to the CPP reference named requirement container, uh, then we would need to have a max size uh, member function. But algorithms don't necessarily need to use a max size. It's very rare that I've ever had to use it, if ever outside of a toy program. And yet that is something that a container would need to have. Similarly, a number concept is going to have problems when we try to pin down exactly what a number is. Is it going to mean an integer or a natural number, a rational number? There are a lot of problems and we very quickly poke holes in. We'll, we'll expand on this a lot more uh, in, in due time. Now, as, uh, as I mentioned, generic programming is uh, the basis for concepts. So we should probably define what uh, generic programming is. Uh, for this talk. Generic programming is defined as an approach to programming that focuses on designing algorithms and data structures in the, so that they work in the most efficient way possible in the most general setting possible. And that, that's from a, uh, from a textbook that 
uh, introduced to generic programming. Um, the, the authors of that book then uh, acknowledged that people who write C++ are probably going to be wondering about STL and metaprogramming and, you know, isn't that generic programming as well? The answer is not really. Um, those things are tools to facilitate generic programming, but they, aren't, they don't embody generic programming in and of themselves. Generic programming is a programming paradigm, just like object-oriented programming is another programming paradigm. And I don't think anyone at this point uh, would say that generic, sorry, that object-oriented programming is, uh, is immediately enabled when you type the word class or add a member function to, uh, to, a, uh, to your class. It's got a lot more than just those two things. It's actually a whole way uh, of programming uh, and generic programming is no different. It's a completely independent paradigm and STL and metaprogramming are just ways in which we activate that in C++. Generic programming finds itself rooted in abstract algebra. Uh, almost all the ideas come from abstract algebra. So we should probably have a little bit of an uh, understanding of abstract algebra to facilitate uh, this talk as well. Don't worry if you're not uh, in a mathematician, you'll still be able to follow along. Um, so Wolfram Mathworld defines abstract algebra as the set of topics in algebra that deal with abstract algebraic structures rather than the usual number systems. And for mathematics and generic programming, says that one of the remarkable things about abstract algebra is that we can prove results for structures such as groups without knowing uh, anything about either the specific items in the group or the operation. If you're not familiar with what a group is, it's a, it's a set that's paired with an operation where the operation needs to follow certain rules. Uh, that, that's really all you need to know for, uh, for this talk with respect to groups. But I do want to labor on this, uh, this second quote just a little bit longer. I'm going to stress certain words. One of the most remarkable things about abstract algebra is that we can prove results for structures such as groups without knowing anything about either the specific items in the group or the operation. Now, I'm going to butcher this a little bit and, uh, and change it so that way it's relevant to uh, generic programming. And so the way in which we, uh, we do that is to say that one of the uh, remarkable things about generic programming is that we can prove results for concepts such as ranges without knowing anything about either the specific items in the range or the operation. If I, uh, if I flip back and forth between them, you should hopefully be able to see that generic programming is really um, a way of linking abstract algebra to programming in, in, the, in the concrete form. That's, that's really how uh, generic programming uh, exists. And that it makes, uh, makes things a lot easier to reason about. Um, but since I've brought these topics up, you may be concerned, do I need to have a background in abstract algebra? And the answer is no. I am not a mathematician by training. I, in fact, spectacularly failed two uh, mathematics courses during my uni degree and had to retake one of those two courses in order to graduate. Uh, so hopefully that, um, that eases any concerns about people who, aren't, who don't have a strong maths background. Um, you really just need to be able to understand the first function and then see how the second function does exactly the same thing, but applies to a broader set of types. If you can follow that, um, then you should be good for this talk. Now, I have spent roughly 15 minutes talking about a whole bunch of things and have not mentioned the word concept once. So I'm going to introduce what a concept is from a usability perspective. And that is that a concept is a collection of named requirements for some algorithm or data structure. And requirements come in three inextricable forms. We will consider the application of std ranges begin on some, uh, some object R. And so the first set of requirements are called syntax requirements. We know these as constraints most often. And constraints are basically saying, does this syntax actually uh, work? The compiler checks this and it will either uh, let things go ahead or it will reject it and give us a diagnostic. So a constraint for the... Uh, for std ranges begin uh, is that we can call it and that it returns and uh, that 
that stood ranges begin, returns, and iterate. And then we have semantic requirements, also known as axioms. And that is that uh, if for this particular um, for this particular expression, uh, the axiom is that we return an iterator to the first element of the range. Now, axioms do not get checked by the compiler. A, a sufficiently smart uh, static analyzer could probably uh, do some sort of homework verification and uh, and and check things, but that is not the world that we live in today or potentially ever. Writing this stuff is actually extremely difficult. However, uh, the way in which we can check these sorts of things are by doing uh, by doing things like assertions, uh, where we will we will check the, the preconditions and the postconditions. So it's still very important that we follow the rules, of the axioms, the algorithms that. Uh, that use these sorts of things will definitely be assuming that these axioms are true always. And then the final, uh, the final uh, uh, requirement that is um, that's inextricably linked to these three things, these these two other things, is uh, the complexity requirements. And a complexity requirement just basically says that you know something operates in particular space or time uh, bound. And for the case of stood ranges begin. Uh, it needs to happen in amortized constant time. That's basically it. And so that's uh, that's the definition of the concept. But we need to first, before we, before we start looking at, uh, at anything else, we need to acknowledge that whether or not we design a concept or we discover a concept. The initial version of this talk was titled Designing a User-Facing Concept. It was for a different conference. And that was uh, a conference that Eric Nebel was, was at. He, uh, I was concerned that he and I were going to have some overlap and wanted to sequence our talks. Turns out we didn't need to sequence our talks, but he did provide a bit of unsolicited advice in that he said that designing a concept is not what we do. We discover them by looking at our algorithms and seeing what they need. Just like plants and animals, mathematics simply exists. We... Uh, we don't invent animals. Um, similarly, we don't invent notation to describe maths, but um, so we do invent notation to describe maths, but we don't invent its rules. Um, just like we observe animals and then report uh, their, their taxonomies and, and things, uh, we don't design relationships between objects, but rather we observe them and report what they are. This is very important to... Uh, to working out what concepts we have and need. And so what both Eric and I are trying to say is that we always, always, always need to consider the use cases before we write a concept, always. In act two, we're going to start looking at, uh, at a few things. Um, uh, so we're gonna start off by looking at these six different loops and they are all uh, doing something in common, uh, and I want you to think about what that uh, what that thing is. I don't have the Discord chat open, so I can't see any any commentary, unfortunately. But I want you to have a have a bit of a think about what they are, and um, then we'll we'll move on. Okay, so these are all examples of left folds. An example uh, uh, in words of what a left fold is uh, would be a, a summation or a product, which is what the top two are. Um, a lot of the, uh, the standard algorithms can be defined in terms of, of left folds. I'm not sure whether it's Connor Hoekstra or Ben Dean, but one of them has presented um, an, uh, an enormous number of uh, of standard algorithms implemented as folds. So um, in, in this particular set, we have both all of and any of on the left and the right. Those are also left folds. And then uh, at the bottom, we have on the left, a, a version of max. Uh, uh, of, of max. Uh, and then on the right, we have just a very general thing that is completely unrelated to everything else. Um, but these are all examples of left folds. And a left fold, if you're not familiar, is basically where we, um, we have some initial value and then we coalesce a sequence of elements into that value by applying 
some function, for example, plus. So if we start with zero and then have one, two, three, four, five, it will add them all together and give us uh, the, the summation of that. Um, and so that's essentially the, uh, the idea of a left fold. And left fold has been proposed for C++23. Um, it is, uh, it should be in, um, it should be, it should be going into the standard at some point, um, but this is a proposal. I cannot promise that it will be in C++23. I cannot promise that it will look like what it does in this particular uh, session. Um, a proposal does not guarantee something will be made available ever. It does not guarantee that it will be available in its current form. Um, and so you need to understand that while moving forward, when we look at the implementation of, uh, of a left fold. So the first thing we need to do in order to get ourselves, get ourselves a left fold that works in all these cases and just has a common descriptor is to normalize the code that we have because the, uh, the, the previous slide uh, showed, um, showed examples that were in three different formats. We want to have a common format so that way we can reason about everything and look at the requirements and say, yes, these all have the same requirements. So the first thing we need to do is, uh, is take a look at this and turn it from its compound assignment uh, expressions into the infix, uh, uh, into, into the infix uh, operation, which is where we have instead of um, uh, a, uh, sum plus equals i, it's sum equals sum plus i. And that make, that puts it on par with the uh, with the all of and the any of um, uh, aspects, uh, sorry, uh, uh, loops, but those aren't the most general setting because the majority of our operations happen as um, as function calls, not as, as, uh, uh, as infix operations. So we now need to turn these, uh, these and the, uh, the logical one operations into a, uh, into function calls, and we do that by using std plus, std multiplies, std logical and, and std logical or. The uh, the any of algorithm is not on screen simply because I didn't have the, the space for it. But now that we have it in function syntax, we can start considering the requirements. And the requirements uh, we start off with are thinking about what properties we can see on inspection. Now, the first one is that we can iterate over a sequence. This algorithm uses a, a range. So that's, that's the very first requirement for this algorithm. The second is that we are going to be reading what it is that we are iterating over, which means that our range is readable. Uh, that, that's very important. We don't look back on, uh, on, on previous elements, and that implies that we don't look forward as well, which means that this is a single pass algorithm. And that's, that's very important for this, particular, uh, for, this, uh, for this particular algorithm, which we will see in, in a few slides time. Uh, the operation takes two parameters as its input, and it returns something that is directly assigned to our accumulator. So what we're gonna do now is we will um, we'll parameterize the the algorithm, so that way it works for all of them, and we'll apply the really low-hanging fruit. That is, we will apply the std input iterator and std sentinel for uh, the input iterator to the function. Uh, if you're not familiar with what sentinels are, Tristan Brindle has some fantastic uh, talks online about ranges where he will introduce sentinels to you. Um, but essentially think of it like a rule for denoting the end of a range. Um, so this is the this is the original definition that we have for uh, for fold left, but we can improve it a little bit further. And I'm going to pause for just a moment to have you think about uh, how we can improve it. On screen, we have uh, we have some strings in a vector, and we're going to concatenate them into a into a spaceless sentence. This is by no means a good way to concatenate strings. I do not recommend it in practice, but this, uh, this is a good way to communicate without introducing a lot of complexity what is missing from the left fold. So the thing that is missing is that um, we are always um, overriding 
the spaceless sentence. Uh, we are never reading from it outside of CONCAT, meaning that we can just move spaceless sentence into CONCAT and then take it out of uh, out of CONCAT. And that means that we are going to not be potentially copying really expensive things. So that means that uh, we would probably uh, uh, want to do that in our, in our algorithm as well, meaning that um, once we have the move, we should probably start thinking about what we need to say about our, uh, about our T, which is uh, for init. And so if we look at, at T, uh, so at the things that involve T, we can see that we are moving T into the, oper into the operation that we're invoking. And then we are going to be uh, assigning it directly to the initial value. That means that T needs to be move constructible and move assignable, which is also known as being movable. So the first requirement that we add is going to be uh, movable. And now we need to be thinking about the operation itself. Um, we've already applied the std invoke instead of doing a direct function call because that is the most general way to call a function. Um, but we need to think about what else we're doing. So the first thing is, as just mentioned, that we are invoking the operation. We have uh, the first parameter being the type T, and then the second parameter is the reference type of the iterator. That means that we, uh, that we need to have uh, our operation be invocable with respect to T and the iterator's reference type. So now we can apply that to op, and that is done. The next thing that we need to do is say that we can assign the, uh, the result of that operation to uh, the T because they may not be the same type. And so that, that's a very important thing to consider as well. Finally, we need, to, uh, we need to have the operation be copy constructible. I cannot remember the reason. Uh, I, I do look it up every time I uh, every time I go to write an algorithm and then promptly forget. Um, so I do apologize for that, but it is one of the requirements of this algorithm. All of this is a bit of a mouthful. So let's banish all of this into a detail uh, concept. So this isn't a use facing concept. It's, uh, it's a detail concept. Uh, but it will make it much more digestible. And digestibility is an important part of documenting code. So we have this indirectly left foldable concept that makes it much easier to, to read. And then if you need to know what the details of that are, you just head over to the, uh, to the detail concept. That should be documented. But it is not something that a user can directly use. All right, so someone comes along with a new use case. They, uh, they have a sequence of doubles and they, um, they, they pass in 0, 0.0 um, uh, and then we just want to add everything. And if they pass in 0, 0.0, it passes. But if they pass in zero, it fails. And it, we don't get two for the integer case, only for the, uh, for the floating point case. And the reason for this is because this is the logical equivalent of what the code is going to be uh, in, in the left fold when we pass in an integer. And so what will happen is um, the, uh, the values when they're being put in the accumulator will be, tr um, will be truncated because that's how double the integer conversions work. And so 1.75 becomes one, and then, uh, then there'll be 1.25 and that will become one as well. And so we only ever end up with one because those less those those partial values will uh, will be zero by uh, oh, sorry that they'll be they'll, they'll be removed and that is uh, that is a bit of a problem. So we need to fix the algorithm. The way in which we fix the algorithm is to uh, to say that in the interface that we're going to work out the return type uh, in the body of the function and then uh, immediately work it out from the return type of the uh, of the Operation itself, and so we have a we have a few new things that have uh, that, that have changed, which is a bit of a problem now because um, even though we are we are doing this correctly, our algorithm doesn't uh, doesn't have the same requirements, and so our concept is a bit out of date. Um, 
And specifically, the two things highlighted are what's out of date. So the first thing we need to do is create a new concept that will improve the readability of the detail concepts. Uh, that's important because as, as this uh, grows in complexity, we will need to, um, we'll need to make the indirectly left foldable concept a fair bit more complex if we don't have a second detail concept. So there are three new expressions to fold left. The, uh, the first one is the, uh, the invocation. Um, and it being decayed, that will come into play in a little bit. Um, then the next thing is that we are going to be converting uh, a move operation, and then we're going to be doing a new, new kind of invocation. So the first thing that we need to do is convert, um, convert our T to the return type of our function. And that means that, uh, that T needs to be uh, convertible to the decayed result. Decay result is the uh, is the decay T of the invoke result. It's R for, uh, for readability on slides in the code, but we'll be calling it decay result in, uh, in the concepts. The next thing we need to do is invoke the operation where the parameter, uh, the first parameter will have the type R and the second parameter will have uh, the reference to the, uh, to the, re uh, the iterator's reference type. Um, the, difference between this and the previous one is that the first parameter had type T, now it has type R. So we need to say that the operation is invocable with respect to the decayed result and the iterator's reference type. And then just as before, R can be moved. So we need to say that, that the decayed result is movable. And then finally, uh, we can assign the, um, the result of our invocation to the, uh, to the accumulator. So we have to be able to say that the, the, the decay result uh, can be assigned uh, the result from the operation. The reason we need to have it be a decay result is because our, our operation may return a reference, but the rules of auto mean that when we use auto, we are going to be decaying to a non-reference. And so that means that, um, that we'll also need to have our raw result be convertible to a decayed result. And then to combine all this, we, uh, we will uh, put this all in the detail concept. And uh, that is our, our second detail concept. And this brings us to the end of Act 2. I'm going to take questions again in a moment. If you don't have questions, uh, I want you to think about whether or not we can compute these two operations any faster. Let's, uh, let's now enter Act 3, which is going to, by the end of this session, give us a user-facing concept. So the first thing uh, to, to address is whether or not we can actually compute these operations faster. And the answer is maybe. It's not a guarantee and it doesn't work in all situations, but loop unrolling can help us out from time to time. The fold, uh, the fold left operation when it's, uh, when it's bundled up on GCC is significantly slower than, uh, than its counterpart uh, when it's unrolled. And unrolling um, can let us uh, invoke what's known as instruction level parallelism. I'll get into uh, what's going on there in a little bit. If you're familiar with these terms, it's instruction level parallelism, not data level parallelism. So the fold left uh, algorithm will start with an initial value and then walk through all of, the, uh, all of the elements one by one and do the operation, which implies that there is, there may be, not that there is, but there may be a dependency um, on, on later values than, uh, than uh, current, uh, with respect to current values. And so that means the optimizer can't really do anything in, uh, in a lot of situations. It should be able to in many situations, but uh, there are situations where it just won't be able to reason about that. Loop unrolling might be able to, uh, to achieve something, something else. So what we do is we compute uh, the operation uh, of T0 and T1 uh, in parallel to, well, sorry, and then we compute the, the results of T2 and T3, and that communicates to the optimizer 
these things have no dependency, so you can do them at the same time. And then the uh, the uh, the CPU will pipeline this, so it does it does this in, at one point, and then it will uh, it'll combine them again to be in some sort of temporary. And while it's doing that, it will start this for the next uh, the next four elements, and then it will combine the first four elements into the accumulator while it's doing the uh, the next four elements and so on and so forth. Um, this is how loop unrolling can get us better performance. But as usual, we need to be benchmarking our code before we try to optimize by hand. The optimizer can often do a better job. Or we may be pessimizing our code in uh, when we want to uh, actually be improving it. That's not a good thing. So on GCC, uh, we, we see an improvement. It's not quite as an, uh, an improvement for multiplication with, with floating point numbers as it was for addition. But the reason that uh, on Clang, it's the opposite way. I checked with a, someone who is familiar with the LLVM backend about this, and it's because optimizers are written to be very dumb. They're intelligent or they're, they're smart being told, they're doing what they're told to do, but they are dumb when it comes to uh, programmers intervening. So if a programmer comes in and says, I want to do loop unrolling, the optimizer will go, okay, you know better than me about your situation. I'm going to stop and just do exactly what you tell me. I'm not going to do any more inference. Uh, it's clear that you know better about the situation. In this case, that wasn't, uh, that wasn't a good thing, and the loop unrolling actually uh, hurts the situation. So please always benchmark your code before you uh, go and do something like this. However, this, uh, this idea of instruction level parallelism gives us a, a lot of in interesting insight into uh, further discovering concepts. And so we're going to leverage that uh, if for the remainder of the talk. Um, data level parallelism actually unlocks even more in terms of concepts, but we don't have the time to cover that. So let's, uh, let's write a ranges version of reduce, which is the name of the standard algorithm that allows for us to be doing things like loop unrolling and uh, having things to be a little bit unsequenced. Um, it's going to be a little bit different to the uh, to the former one, but it is still hopefully going to feel familiar. So the bits that are grayed out are bits from the previous stuff where we we remove uh, we return just the initial value if the range is empty. We have an accumulator that that does the first computation. So that way we get the right type and then. Uh, we're also going to defer back to fold left uh, if uh, we reach the base case. Now, the base case is that there are fewer than four elements, um, and we are going to uh, we are going to work on four elements at a time, and then combine those results, and, uh, and then combine them again in order to get the new value for the uh, the accumulator. This is similar to what Libstead C plus plus does in its std reduce. Um, now. The, uh, the low-hanging fruit is stuff we can apply, so let's do that. Because we are directly calling fold left, all of the requirements for fold left are implicitly going to be requirements for reduce. So this is, our good, this is a good starting point. But the highlighted sections in the body of the code are still, um, still new expressions, none of which are covered by any of our, our previous uh, uh, our previous their requirements. So we now need to consider these uh, these six things. So let's start off with the iterator requirements because they're the they're easiest to reason about. The first is that we want to be able to do uh, we, we want to be able to do last minus first, which is uh, what we call a sized sentinel, and it will uh, compute in constant time the distance between two iterators. If we can't do this in constant time, then we are not going to be able to take advantage of any of the optimizations that loop unrolling would give us. So that is the, the first syntax requirement and, um, and both an axiom and a complexity requirement. Uh, the next thing is that we can do arbitrary steps in constant time. That is skipping over a number of elements. And that's also important because we, uh, again, if we were to iterate through them one by one, uh, we would be doing that in linear time and it would uh, basically cancel out any gains that we got from the, uh, from the, uh, from the loop unroll. 
Then finally, for exactly the same reason again, we want to be able to index elements and get uh, get them uh, one by one. Uh, so get them in immediately rather than having to uh, yeah, to iterate through them. So all these syntax things have to happen in constant time with uh, with particular rules. And the only iterator that gives us all of these, along with the uh, the previous requirements of the input iterator, is a random access iterator. It also gives us the multi-pass guarantee, which means that we can look forward and back uh, in a range at any point in time and expect everything to be uh, to still be holding. So this is our first uh, first requirement, and that's three of the requirements just uh, eliminated now. The next one is to consider the uh, is to consider the new operation applications. The uh, th this particular invocation is on um, on two references at the same time, as opposed to it just being on the right hand side. So we need to say that op is uh, invocable with respect to the iterator's reference type on the left and the right hand side. We do this twice, and we do them in such a way that um, that. We're going to be calling the function um, in a in a non uh, in a non deterministic sequence, and so that means that if uh, if first zero and first two are the same value, and first one and first three are the same value, and then we combine first zero and first one and do the same for two and three, but they give us different results. There's going to be both surprising and upsetting. Uh, so we have this, this notion uh, where we say that uh, parameters that are equal should yield equal outputs. And um, so, for example, zero plus zero is always going to be zero and, uh, and one plus one is always going to be two. And so zero plus one should always be one, regardless of whether we call it first or second. And to get this in C++, we have this thing called regular invocable. So rather than having using uh, saying that op is invocable with respect to the two reference parameters, um, we are going to say that op is a regular invocable with respect to those, um, those two parameters. And then what we need to do is we need to say that the, uh, the invocation of the uh, of the return type is convertible to the uh, to the R uh, that, that we have the result type, and this uh, this this brings us to the end of what I'm calling the trivial trivial requirements. By trivial, I mean we have solely stayed in the realm of C plus plus. We have not gone any further into abstract algebra beyond the definitions of. Uh, of iterators and how they map into the mathematics. But now we need to do that for the remainder of this, uh, this concept and uh, the algorithm's requirements. So we first need to define an operation. Uh, up until this point, I've kind of loosely used the term operation to describe any function call. But in mathematics, according to Wikipedia at least, an operation is some sort of function that takes a number of parameters and gives back a well-defined output value. And that operations will have this thing known as a domain of definition. And when you pass in something from the domain of definition, you get back something from the codomain. Um, now, I'm going to define those, those features because um, they are math terms and uh, we are a, a room of programmers. So the domain of definition is essentially a subset of the domain, the things that you can pass in, uh, that an operation is defined for. For example, with the uh, with the square root function, its domain is the set of real numbers, but its domain of definition, that is the things that make sense to pass in, uh, are going to be the uh, non-negative real numbers. If we pass in negative one to square root function, it's going to be invalid. And on a calculator, you'll get an error, um, uh, but in mathematics, it's just, uh, known as undefined within the real number space. Uh, we're not venturing into complex numbers here. And in C++ land, this can be uh, this can be described in several ways. We could throw an exception if we don't meet the domain definition. We could fire an assert. We could return an expected with an error. Uh, in the standard, there are uh, there are two of those things that could happen. 
Um, then we also have undefined behavior, unspecified behavior, and ill form no diagnostic required, uh, which is where the program is invalid, but the compiler may not tell you that it's invalid. Uh, when we violate uh, uh, concept axioms, this is typically what happens. But all of this, uh, when put together, basically means that the definition, the domain, because we have a domain of definition, the, uh, it doesn't need to be total, it can be a subset. And that is why things like uh, floating point numbers can still be considered totally ordered, even though comparing two NANs will give us back a nonsensical result. It's because floating point comparisons don't include NAN. Um, and so we're going to be using this domain of definition to, uh, to build up a binary operation, which is derived from the mathematics definition and will also, uh, also be a part of the, uh, the, the binary operation definition. So we have, um, we have the, uh, this idea that an operation is going to be regular invocable with respect to its, uh, its left-hand side and its right-hand side. Uh, the result is going to be uh, able to be passed to a constructor of the, of the result type, that is R. And um, then it's also going to be assignable. Now, these are all the syntax requirements. We now need to define what the semantic requirements are. And those are going to be that uh, the types T and U represent the operations domain. Um, that is important because, um, because it allows us to do things such as have cross type operations and cross set operations. In terms of cross type operations, um, we want to be able to uh, say add an int and a float. That, uh, that just means that T and U both represent the set of rational numbers. We may also want to take a mathematical vector and multiply it against a float, which is uh, a cross type operation, uh, such as, uh, which, which uh, sorry, there's a cross type operation, uh, which is vector scalar multiplication. The second one, uh, axiom is that the type R represents the codomain. And uh, so the operations codomain. And the reason this is important, both in the syntax form and in the semantic form, is because it prevents us from returning arbitrary things and prevents us from having a, a return type of void. The, uh, the, the type R is supposed to represent what we are getting back. And then finally, the value returned from the invocation needs to be an element of the operations codomain. The codomain is basically the set of things that you have um, uh, as your results from an operation. And that's important as well because it means that we can't uh, uh, have a, we call something an addition operation and then have one plus one return a, uh, a complex number if we're not operating in the complex number space. If we're operating in the integer space, it needs to return an integer. And then from this, we can build up a, uh, a new concept. This concept is called a magma. Magma is, um, is a binary operation. Uh, it's, it's just a, a general binary op operation um, that's associated with a set where its, uh, its domain and codomain are the same. And uh, so our constraints are that, um, that we have a binary operation where we can pass in two Ts and two Us and then one of each on either side. Our axioms are going to be that for an operation and then two Ts and two Us, the domain and the codomain of the operation are going to be the same. So we are, even though we may be able to represent our codomain and uh, sorry, our domain and codomain using different types, they're all going to be representing the same thing. So if we have floating point numbers, then we're probably going to be wanting to represent the rational numbers or limit ourselves to a very specific set of integers. Um, the second thing is basically, the second axiom is basically saying that if we have um, any permutation of the of the uh, of the parameters, we are going. We are always going to get back the same result. So, if we pass in uh, an operation of 
um, of one and two, and that means we get back three because we have addition, then passing in 1.0 and 2.0 should give us back 3.0. Um, so that is a, uh, an important part of this. Now we come to an axiom that might be overlooked. So we have these three operations and our data is going to be just one, two, three, four. For addition, we have, um, if we do one plus two, we get back three. And then if we do three plus four, we get back seven. And then if we combine those results as we do in reduce, we will uh, get 10. Now let's, uh, let's change things up a little bit. We'll do two plus three and we get back five. And then we get, if we do a y equals x plus four, we get back nine. And the last thing we have is one and one plus nine is 10. So that means that our result is exactly the same. Now, if we do that with, a, with subtraction, we have uh, one minus two, that's minus one, three minus four, negative one, and, x uh, and then if we do x minus y, we get back zero. So we should expect the final thing to be, uh, to be zero as well uh, when we mix things up like we did for the addition, but it's not. Turns out that the answer is going to be six. And the reason is because um, there is this rule that is, this, uh, that is, um, is attached to addition and multiplication that is not a part of division and subtraction called associativity which basically means that no matter how we rearrange the order of the operation, if something is associative, we are going to always get back the same result at the very end. Uh, and so because this applies to not just addition and subtraction, we can actually think of, we, we, so we can actually come up with a broad set of, uh, of uh, things that are associative and things that are not associative. We can, um, we can definitely, uh, say that this is a general property that needs to be considered when we're looking at ranges for use. So the way in which we describe this is that um, we say that a binary operation is going to be associative if we can first apply um, X and Y and then apply that result to Z and that will equal first applying Y and Z and then applying the result of Y and Z uh, to, to X. And if that gives us the same result, then it's associated. In programmer speak, if we take away requirements for a moment, then uh, this is just saying we'll call a function on Y and Z and call the function on X. And if, that's, uh, if that gives us a, a result, it'll be the same as first applying uh, the function to X and Y and then applying that result with Z, and that will give us the, uh, the result. And now we come to the... Uh, the idea of combining our magma concept with this associativity property. And that is called a semigroup. So we, we start out by um, we start out by looking at the, the, the constraints of the semigroup, and it is that it is a magma, but then we also want to be able to apply the results of the magma to uh, to the operation again on both the left and the right hand side. And so that means that we have, we have to be able to call the magma in three different ways and that those things all have to be magnets. Then we have the axioms. Now the, the first axiom is that, um, sorry, the only axiom is that when we invoke it, um, it's going to be uh, equal with respect to associativity. And we, we, we basically are just writing this down in some formal way. It's that way the concept is, uh, is going to have both its constraints and its axioms meet that pair up. But all of this is really just describing this property here plus the magma and its constraints. So now let's head back to the concept, so the algorithm, and specify its requirements. So we have stood random access iterator. And then we will add this semi-group requirement as well. And if you look closely, you'll see that it doesn't have the detail concept. There's like the detail namespace uh, prefixed on it, which means that this is going to be our user-facing concept. We also need to consider applying this uh, to the uh, to the uh, to the result types, not just the reference types because it is applied again at the, at the very bottom. 
And uh, as, as mentioned, this is the, uh, the user-facing concept. So we have reached the end of Act 3. And now let's, uh, let's go into anticipating a few questions because we still have a bit of time. The first thing I want to address is, and I don't have a slide for this, but I use the keywords and or not. Um, those are things that appear in my, in my slides. Um, I don't use ampersands or, or pipes to indicate logical operations. I don't use the exclamation mark. Um, and this is always a question whenever I, whenever I present. Someone asks, why are you using these words instead of the symbols? And then they ask, you know, is this actually standard C++? Is it a thing from C++ 17 or, or something? And the answer is that I use them because I find it to be much more readable code when I, when I spell out those words. The symbols uh, actually make it much harder for me to read the code. And they've been standard ever since the beginning. Um, C++ has, standard C++ has always had those keywords. So if you want to switch today, you absolutely can. Um, now, a, um, a question that you may have is, why are some concepts public while well, others are private? And the reason for that is because the public concepts are the things that apply to a broad range of, uh, of algorithms. Something like indirectly left foldable is very specific to uh, to left fold. It, it's not even applicable to a right fold, uh, which is working in the opposite direction to left fold. Um, something like semigroup is going to be uh, applicable to a large number of domains. I haven't shown that in this talk because there isn't enough time to look at other algorithms, but that is the case. Um, I, I will leave that as an exercise for you. If you want to derive something similar to partial fold, you may, it's not partial fold, Yes, partial fold. Uh, it's also known as partial sum or scan. Um, then you may uh, then you may uh, find that uh, that semi group is going to be an interesting thing for you there as well. Um, that then uh, leads on to another question. Well, are the private concepts things that are still user facing? And for doc for documentation purposes, absolutely. But they're not user facing in the sense that you should be allowed to, as a user, go and type them. User facing in this context means can I type out these things and then have them reasonably be stable uh, and not be subject to Hiram's law? The, we, we come back to the question of can we write a container or number concept? And the answer is still no. Um, the, again, concepts do not have a prescriptive inter, uh, interface like thing from Java and C Sharp. They outline the minimum number of things that you need to, uh, to have in order to use something rather than saying you need to at least have these things in order to be implementing this particular interface. Uh, you can do a lot of things with a number, but most of them aren't necessary all the time. If you were to say that a reduce needed to be a number and then number required addition, subtraction, multiplication and division, well, firstly, that's not a complete definition of a number because number is such a broad uh, uh, broad term, but also left fold or reduce, they don't require anything more than the operation. And so saying that you need to have subtraction, multiplication and, and division when you're only wanting addition is not going to be helpful to you. In, in terms of container, um, I don't find that to be an interesting concept because it's not really adding anything, uh, anything interesting um, on its own. But there are things about containers that are unique to uh, that set of ranges that may actually be, uh, be worthwhile looking into um, if we do the research for. And those things are uh, things like ins having an insertable range and a, uh, and a an erasable range, which basically mean can we do things like pushback or insert um, and pop back or erase? Those sorts of things would fall into those sorts of concepts. Um, now, the research there is that, 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 that that's a line of thinking that I've had for a while, but I haven't done uh, anywhere near enough research to think about what a particular uh, library would look like. If this is something you're interested in, by all means, reach out to me, but you will need to do a lot of the research and I will probably just be coordinating and advising in that regard. So remember, concepts are not the same as interfaces. Finally, this is uh, going to take us to, well, what requirements can I put on my types? 
And the answer is that like functions, you need to think about what's critical for your type to participate um, in, your, in, your, in your critical algorithms. Uh, working this out isn't always very clear from ins inspection. Uh, it's not immediately clear to me why, range why all range adapters need to have input range on the type that they adapt. And so I'm going to leave that as an exercise for you. Uh, it is an interesting exercise to go through. It feels like it should be obvious, but it, uh, it absolutely isn't. Uh, and so that is a bit of homework. If you want to learn more about generic programming, then, um, then from mathematics to generic programming and elements of programming are both good books to read. From mathematics to generic programming is a light introduction uh, and walks you through everything. It's, uh, it's harder counterpart is Elements of Programming, which is available online for free, thanks to the authors. Uh, there's also Stepanov Papers, which has a lot of out Stepanov's uh, work. He is the pioneer of generic programming, um, as Sean mentions in his history talk. If you're interested in instruction level parallelism, here are three books that I consulted to understand how, uh, how that can help us out here. And uh, finally, we have uh, in summary that concepts describe an algorithm's requirements, uh, not the properties of category for a category of types. Uh, concepts have broad, uh, that are, are broad for, uh, are user facing, but if they're narrow, they should be implementation details that you document. If you want to uh, uh, do some sort of optimization on your naive code, always benchmark it so that way you don't pessimize. Uh, we find requirements by studying algorithms and generic programming always starts with the use cases. That's discovering a user-facing concept. Thank you so much for watching and I will be available in Gather Town or on Discord uh, for the next little while. But I'm happy to take questions.